going to be talking about the trained challenges and research on elderly care in Asia and bringing uh, some of my own work, and, but also other people's work in this area. As you know, the aging trend is a global phenomenon. Since 2018, there have been more people over the age of 64 than children younger than five globally. In 2020, there are 733 million age 65 and older adults. And over the next three decades, it is projected that this number would reach to 1.5 billion in 2050, accounting for about 16% of the total population. And it's worth mentioning that those who are 80 and above, usually called the oldest folk, is the fastest growing group. It's projected to reach 446 million in 2050. Amid to this global aging trend, Asian Pacific has the most rapid growth of older adults. In 2050, one in four people will be over the age of 60. That's three times more uh, than what the number is in 2010. And we should notice that there will be more older women than men because a uh, woman has longer life expectancy. Um, the Asian experience of aging has several unique aspects, which I would like to share with you. One is the pace of the aging, and the secondly, magnitude. And thirdly, the economic and social developmental context that this aging trend is happening. And the demographic landscape is quite different from other uh, areas too. Further, the cultural values and expectations on how an old adult uh, is to be taken care of and who should be paying for it, it's quite different. And finally, the public policy and welfare regime in Asia is quite different from uh, Asian and the United States and North American countries as well. So this Asian trend in Asia is occurring in the context of compressed modernity in the last almost uh, five decades, with unprecedented economic growth and social political transformation, awakening the traditional value of private piety that older adults, parents expect adult children in particular their sons, to care for them. And also a strong familistic welfare schemes that usually provide generally weak public safety nets for older adults compared to the Western country. In terms of the pace or speed of aging, it takes a much shorter time for Asian countries to transition from an aging population to an aged population just 14% of the uh, population of age 65 and older. For friends, it takes 115 years to make this transition. For the United States, 65 years. And Japan, the oldest country in Asia, took only 26 years. Thailand, China, Vietnam, all around 20 years. And Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, it all takes about only 17 or 18 years to move from 7% of the population who is 65 and over to 14% of, of the uh, uh, population that are 65 and older. In terms of magnitude, Asia accounts for uh, a very large proportion of the world population. Of the almost 8 billion population uh, now, Asia account for almost 60% of them. And if you look at the population size, the largest country, China and India, but the third largest country or fourth largest country, Indonesia, is also quite large. Then Pakistan, Bangladesh, Japan, and Philippines, Vietnam. These are all very large countries that also uh, would contribute to a large number of elderly population in the world in the next few decades. So here's a UN population projection for those um, who 
who are age 16 and over uh, from 1980s to 2015, and here we're uh, 2020 here. This is an increase by region. And you can see in the next three decades, the biggest increase is in this yellow no, uh, color block, and that is uh, Asia. That's most of the growth will be in Asia. And for 80% uh, 80 year olds uh, and above, that's even a bigger proportion in the global uh, society. So um, you can see that uh, in terms of magnitude, Asia will account for a lot, most of the uh, Asian population in the world. And uh, so some examples, Japan is already a super aged society uh, with about 28% of the population 65 and older, and 80,000 of them are more than uh, 100 years old. And since 2018, the population has started shrinking already in, in Japan. Uh, these other countries, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, all follow us quite closely too. <clears throat> China and India, uh, the two countries together, uh, will account for a lot of uh, elderly population in the world. Uh, there are more than uh, all the European countries uh, combined. Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. They're all at a key stage where improved uh, average life expectancy and declining fertility rate have resulted in rapidly growing population. If you look at Asia in different regions, East Asia is the oldest. Right now, they have about 14% of the region has about 14% of uh, population 65 and older. By the 2060s, one in three, uh, more than one in three of the population will be 65 and older. And the other Asian countries uh, as well, you can see about 20, 20% uh, in 2016 will also be Asian population. So uh, one important lesson for the Asian trend is that the life expectancy has lengthened substantially in the last more than five uh, decades. And uh, here is just a show of uh, some numbers. In 2000 and to 2015 on the life expectancy, and, uh, more Sorry, uh, uh, Professor Young. Professor yes. Young, could you could you please uh, bring your microphone a bit closer to you, so uh, your your audio is more clear. Is it better now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. That, does that mean that you didn't hear what I said earlier? Uh, we did hear, but uh, it wasn't very, very clear. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Thank you. So this is the life expectancy uh, in, in some Asian countries. Uh, the most recent data in 2022, Hong Kong it has the longest life expectancy, followed by Japan, Macau, and so on. The top eight countries with the longest life expectancy are all in Asia. But note that there's quite a bit of diversity in different countries. With uh, Myanmar, for example, still at the age of 65, life expectancy in 2015. Uh, the second reason for the aging trend is the total fertility rate, how much it has declined. And again, here I show some diversity in different uh, uh, regions of the Asia too, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. And you can see that for all three regions, uh, all have really sharp decline of the fertility, but the levels are quite different. With East Asia has been at a quite a low level, uh, close to one uh, total fertility rate for quite some time. And Southeast Asia, uh, it's a bit higher, uh, averaging right about the replacement level at 2.1, except Singapore is very low. That looks like the East Asian countries. But South Asian countries, most of them are above um, uh, 
replacement level, although India this year also falls below replacement level already. And so as a result, the uh, total uh, 65 and older uh, population in the population, the percentages has been increasing. That's why we have this Asian trends here. Of course, the oldest population is uh, this line at Japan. Uh, then the uh, South Korea is also very low because their fertility level also dropped in a very low level. And um, Singapore. But a lot of countries are still low, but they are also going to be picking up very quickly in the next few decades. 80% and above. The reason why I keep mentioning this is because after 80, the disability level continue uh, increase substantially from the need for uh, old age population uh, for uh, long term care uh, will substantially increase. So it's important to pay attention to this increase of those who the oldest old population. Again, Japan is uh, over eight percent now, and uh, many other countries, in fact, is still around one to two percent. But again, as an example of <clears throat> Thailand, in the next um, uh, three decades, it's going to increase to about 10%. And it's from 2,001% two, uh, to 10% in 2050. So uh, other countries are similar too. So this trend is important to pay attention to. Another thing that is uh, uh, that concerns people is whether these Asian countries are going to get old before they get rich. Uh, for most Western countries, they uh, get into the aged society when they reach a high GDP per capita. This is not the case um, in Asia, in most of the countries. So here uh, is a figure that charted uh, the share of elderly in the total population uh, against uh, GDP per capita. Uh, if we take 1002 as a line where you can start calling a country, uh, I mean 12,000, I'm sorry, start to call a country a high income country, then you see that um, when they pass this point, this is when 7% of the population, total population are um, age 60. Uh, five and above, you can see that this line, Singapore, when it passed this point, the uh, GDP per capita is already uh, 32 percent, uh, 32,000 or so. So this is, they, they turn old when the, the country has already uh, turned rich. Uh, this country is Japan, when it turns uh, into an aging society, uh, the, the GDP per capita also has passed um, uh, $12,000 or so. Uh, this other country is South Korea. It's also not too bad. It's lower, but it's uh, over $12,000 per capita. The other countries are not. Uh, so uh, Malaysia, China, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam, you can see that uh, the point where they I'm really sorry, Professor uh, Young. Your microphone again. Can you not bring much your? I can do. That, not that much is I can do. that's why we tested earlier. They yes, that's continue. fine. Thank you. Well, but okay. I don't know what. What else to do though? Uh, I'm going to skip all that. Uh, cultural context. Uh, Asia has a prevalent uh, family based social norms. So, intergenerational relationship that uh, while piety um, is expected, and there are more co residents where young people, uh, uh, children, are living with older adults. Um, the kinship system is very different from the West. East, uh, and South Asia is the patriarchal uh, system, and Southeast Asia actually a matriarchal or bilateral um, system where they expect more of daughters to take care of uh, the older adults. There's also a lot of ethnic religious diversity. 
and gender norms is expected a woman to take care to be doing the caregiving responsibility and there's also lower resources for women because they're usually not uh, a large number of them not in the labor force partic uh, participating in labor force a large number of them are in informal economy so they're not accumulate uh, enough um, assets in the formal uh, welfare system uh, as they are getting in their adult life. The policy contact Asians is uh, more feministic and male breadwinner welfare regimes. Uh, they're usually much less generous uh, <clears throat> welfare state or systems or uh, a system, even if they, there is a, a system system the level of a system is usually quite low and so the heavy reliance is on family members especially on children in old age uh, so under those circumstances the care becomes a very unprecedented challenge in asia for many countries um, other than what we have talked about uh, family structure has changed um, and also there are a lot of uh, uh, dual earner family models where uh, females family members are also working and have less time available to take care of the older adults. Uh, family structure with three generational household have declined and there are a lot more empty nested family and in particular the living alone one person household have increased substantially. Also because of urbanization and migration um, there are a lot of uh, older adults uh, were left in the rural area uh, when young family members uh, left rural area to go to urban area to look for jobs. So all this uh, social economic structure as well as ideational change in family values and intergenerational and gender relations uh, also created challenges in the uh, long-standing assumption that family and then private care are going to take care of older adults in Asia. So we've done this work in shifting boundaries of care and, and, and to the who is supposed to take care of the older adults and who is supposed to finance this cost of taking care of them. The trend has been moving from family to state and also to market commercial uh, cares and voluntary sectors, including community, to shift. All this is reflecting the cultural value are changing, and uh, also so that welfare state and the family system are also changing quickly that uh, any society need to adapt. One of the most important challenge is uh, providing long-term care. And here we've done a lot of research on this too and show that uh, most of the Asian countries are not uh, prepared for this long-term care um, services and this is the critical global social issues as this long-term care exerts high and continuing economic emotional demands and time costs at the individual family and societal level when older adults who lacked or lost ability to care for themselves uh need to um somehow be care of in this system the big challenges in long-term care uh, in asia including what we had talked about the diminishing family where we talked about southeast asia they expect daughters to take care of the older adults but 22 percent of uh, the older adults actually only have sons and some do not have any children uh, at all or because of migration, the children are not close by. In Singapore, this is a, a very, very high a quarter of those who were born around 1970s are childless and they've never been married. So uh, spousal care and uh, children care are out of the question for these people. The sandwich generation of uh, generation in Taiwan and South Korea make things a lot harder. Uh, to, for for young people, especially married women, to take care of uh, both generations, and so all of this means we need to develop community-based and home-based care for uh, long long-term care in China. 
But the challenge often is that we need uh, not enough qualified caregivers and the monitoring system is not in place and there is not an integrated medical and social care. Uh, also, there's a lot of inequalities. Uh, poverty contribute to the great uh, met need in many countries. Uh, they're in rural um, areas, particularly for women who live longer and have uh, much limited resources. Japan is the front runner in long-term care. Uh, as early as 1960s, they've already have a national long-term care insurance. Taiwan also in 2007 has already uh, put that in place, but a lot of other countries don't. Uh, China in particular uh, where is um, projected to have a really sharp um, rise in the, in the demand for long-term care, but uh, not ready for this yet. So here's a, a chart for the aging trend in China that is also going to be going very fast. From here, about 16, 17% of the population that are 65, it's going to move up to, uh, to quite high level. Um, let me skip this. This is just saying that there are all kinds of infrastructural and financial and personnel challenges that uh, in China that uh, make this uh, unmet need of uh, long-term care uh, very high now, uh, but will be increasing even higher in the next three decades. One thing that have changed a lot and that had strong implication for uh, care, uh, elderly care is the family structure change. I mentioned that uh, one person household had increased and a lot more older um, elderly are uh, living alone. And in fact, a lot of young people are also living alone. Here's the chart of uh, percent of one person household in many different countries. Uh, the blue are uh, Western countries and the red bars are um, Asian countries. The biggest, the uh, highest proportion, as you can see in Europe, uh, they've already uh, over 40 some percent uh, of, of the household only have um, one person living there. Finland, Germany, Denmark, and so on. But uh, in a Asia, it's uh, relatively lower. The highest uh, is Japan. That's more than one third of the total household only has one person living there. And South Korea has 27%. Hong Kong, um, uh, Macau, uh, China, Singapore, all uh, are also around 10, uh, 12 to 15% uh, in that range. Um, this living arrangement is important, so I want to spend a little time using our work in China as an example. Uh, the one-person household is going to increase uh, to very high in 2050. Uh, more than one in five of the household will be only have one person live there. And the three-generational household uh, is going to decrease from 17% to about 6 six percent only um, in 2050. And this is an important uh, topic and uh, many of the uh, journals picked up our research on this, like economists talked about how young people are living alone, how old people, especially the females, because they live longer uh, in urban areas are living alone and who's gonna take care of these uh, old ladies and so on. This is an another example in Bloomberg uh, News to talk about living alone. Uh, I want to especially mention that the increase of living alone in China and, and in other countries too would be especially large for the oldest old group. Um, from 2010 to 2015, it will be almost three times uh, the increase of uh, oldest old living alone. And remember, these are the people who need uh, a lot of uh, long-term care, more long-term care uh, than, than the other group. So it's important to remember that. Let me talk a little bit about what uh, Singapore has done in terms of long-term care. Their focus has been uh, facilitating the aging in place. And through the development of community-based and home care-based uh, kind of uh, care for older adults. 
Uh, the government is working together with the private medical group and voluntary welfare organizations to develop community-based uh, model uh, to care for the elderly. And uh, there are still gaps in the service uh, because of the low fertility rates and change in family uh, structure that we have talked about. Singapore has used a lot of foreign care workers for um, both older adults and um, young children too. Um, some of the uh, policies they've been doing in Singapore, one is providing some uh, incentive for uh, older ch adult children to live close to their uh, elderly parents so it's easier to take care of them and they provide incentives. If they live close by, they get uh, 30,000, 20,000, depending on which group you are, uh, of housing grants to subsidize the housing costs. And they also provide subsidies for foreign domestic helpers. Uh, they, uh, Singapore also tried to strengthen uh, par partnership within the communities, enhance community network for seniors. They have uh, uh, silver ambassadors, those who are more than 65 also to help other younger uh, older adults, helping the older older adults and encourage active, healthy lifestyles to keep people as healthy as possible. Encourage lifelong learning for people to upgrade skills, uh, be it digital skills or life skills, and uh, also subsidize public transit costs. So uh, older adults feel okay to move around more to connect with other people. And they also try hard to integrate health and social support system. Uh, Moreover, they encourage uh, the spirit of giving, um, encourage seniors to give back to the community through volunteering or, or donation and so on, to keep older adults as healthy as possible and have relevant skills and empower them to contribute to the society. So this brings us to the concept of productive aging that a lot of society are using. Are using as a way to uh, address the challenge of elderly care. If the productive aging emphasizes the older adults can be more effective, integrated, and engaged in activities that generate continuous contribution to family, uh, community, and society, including the labor activities, caregiving, and volunteering. And research has shown very clearly that this kind of engagement in meaningful activities contribute to good health, satisfaction with life, and longevity. And these are all good things to pay attention to. We have edited a special volume with about 20 articles in this social science medicine to talk about this uh, productive aging issues, uh, particularly in Asian countries. And you're welcome to have a look at them. Here, uh, one way of doing this uh, productive aging is to extend or postpone the retirement age. And this has been done in most of the OECD country now, with the goal they've been gradually adjusting, with the goal of reaching about age 67 in all countries, most of the countries, uh, by about now, uh, or a little bit um, uh, later, but this is, um, a one way to encourage uh, to address the challenge where there's a shrinking working age population uh, in the pop because of the aging trends. Um, we have done some research in China to look at how delaying retirement, postponing retirement in China could help. As you know, China has a very early uh, retirement age with females at 55 or 50 a male at 60. So if we postponed it for five years where female retired at age 60 and male retired at 65, you can see a very large gain uh, of about on average 42 million of females and 24 million of males per year added to the workforce uh, by 2050. And a lot of these uh, added workforce are so-called the high human capital workforce that has uh, good health and high um, uh, high, uh, high high school education at least. Um, but there's a great 
heterogeneity in different countries and in, in Asia and different gender too. Uh, women are typically uh, engaged in caregiving, uh, parenting, uh, grandparenting, uh, and men are partic uh, uh, typically involved in activities outside of household in terms of association or engaged in economic activities and so on. Um, to be able to encourage productive aging, it is very important to have uh, better infrastructure for older adults and have a neighborhood that are uh, highly cohesive to uh, encourage uh, volunteering and so on. Um, it, research has consistently shown in many different countries, in Asian countries, that volunteering is good for the mental health in all these different countries that we have reviewed. Caregiving, however, is not so, uh, so, so clear cut. We found a lot of negative impact of uh, a grandparenting uh, because maybe because it's uh, the physical strains that imposed, but uh, especially grandmothers in rural areas providing care for parents uh, uh, is actually negatively impact uh, their, their health. Um, so let me skip this here. Some examples that Japan and Korea and Taiwan has been doing involving older adults in daycare center, elementary school, involved in farming, uh, urban farming, rural farming, and, uh, you know, different, uh, teaching activities in schools for children. These are examples of productive aging. So in some, uh, to address uh, um, elderly care in Asia, we need a holistic approach. Uh, we have in Asia the most rapid uh, aging trend, especially the 80s and above that uh, most likely need long-term care pretty soon. And um, the older adults in Asia face many challenges in relation to gender, family dynamics, the changing uh, social norms and inadequate support for in the system. They also have uh, challenges in financial and digital literacies, access to labor markets and long-term care, et cetera. Um, the pandemic, of course, has heightened this, the vulnerability of the older adults, both in terms of physical and mental health, but social ties because of the social distancing. Uh, labor market security, many have lost jobs uh, during this time. And a large proportion of uh, older adults, in particular the older women, are in informal economy that's not covered by the government uh, pension system and other support system. And we also see that there's in inequality by gender, social class, race, and urban rural residences. So policymakers should use a holistic approach to support the region's uh, rapidly growing elderly population. Not just about the healthcare, but also think about the social support, how to improve the infrastructure to uh, facilitate uh, mobility of older adults, uh, how to uh, change social norms and behavior to adapt to this demographic landscape, how to use the technology to help, which could be very helpful, uh, but also labor market, how to think about incorporate older adults in the labor market. Thank you. And I'm Ana Bolio from the Universidad Panamericana here in Mexico. And I have two questions for you. Uh, what are the advances in palliative care for elders? And what impact have China's birth policies had on this demographic shift? Right. Um, I think palliative care, also the trend is uh, that that's part of the long-term care. So the trend is going to uh, switch more to community and uh, home-based care, in particular the home-based care, uh, not uh, done in the hospital. Uh, that's what uh, you know. Taiwan, um, uh, Japan has been doing. Singapore has been doing. So a uh, lot of switch is to community and home base, and then. Um, a lot of commercial um, corporations uh, uh, are coming in to to um, cater this kind of uh, care.
healthcare demands. And the second question is China. It, it, about the one child policy, did you say? Yes. Okay, well, one child policy started in 1979. So obviously uh, because of the decline in uh, fertility rate and the lengthening of the uh, life expectancy, it also created a very uh, large impact. And so that's the reason why uh, the aging trend is uh, moving very rapidly in China too. So yeah, that's definitely very clear. Thank you so much. Um, well, my question is, uh, what do you think about the crisis of the retirement, uh, the mental health problems uh, caused by the fact uh, to, of uh, stop working? And how do you think um, this has to be faced? Thank you so much. If I understand you correctly, you're talking about the potential impact of retiring um, on mental health. People become uh, more depressed and uh, maybe cognitive uh, started to get more impaired more quickly. I think that these are exactly the uh, issues that um, when I talked about uh, productive aging and postponing of retirement age, uh, that is uh, one of the big rationale for people, uh, to, for all the societies to do that. Uh, the research was very clear that when you are engaged in um, uh, meaningful activities and you feel still um, useful to the society, uh, your mental health is better and your cogn cognition um, uh, do, does not decline as quickly as, uh, as otherwise. So definitely that's what uh, people are doing, uh, re delaying retirement age, but also uh, to change the social norm of ageism too. Um, people think that uh, at age 60 or 65, you, you're, you're not useful anymore and you should be, um, it's very difficult for you to find jobs. Uh, these are all the ageism, discrimination uh, that in the institution, those are things that uh, definitely we, uh, you know, is to adapt to. Young, um, Victor Molnar from Hungary, and I would like to hear your opinion about um, uh, parents who usually um, hand, give the raising of their children to the grandparents. For example, maybe the grandparent is already retired and not working anymore, and thus the parent and mother maybe uh, find work a more uh, profitable work somewhere else, far away from home, and thus they are creating this uh, strange family structure where the parents are actually absent and not provide the support for the children that they are needed. Is it same in uh, Asia and the Asian countries where parents maybe even leave the country itself and come back maybe once a month and during that time it's the grandparents role to actually raise the child and how would uh, raising the age for retirement would act uh, affect these kind of families? Thank you for your question. Uh, grandparents are very uh, integral part of uh, families in Asia, probably just like in, in Mexico. Um, so uh, Singapore and uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, these are all countries where work hours for adults are the, the longest in the whole world, in fact. so. Um, Parents working long hours, uh, and grandparents helping. This is a very common uh, situation that we see here. And I also mentioned that in, in Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, these countries uses uh, a lot of uh, foreign domestic uh, workers from Philippines, from uh, neighboring countries, and so on. Um, so it's um, a, a lot of parents are spending a long time. Uh, little time with uh, children, which uh, is not necessarily a good thing for for the children or for the parents. And uh, I also show you that there are potential negative impact for the grandparents too. But a lot of grandparents enjoys taking care of grand 
children too. So it depends on the family circumstances, but we should uh, realize that long time caring for grandchildren is also not very good for uh, grand grandparents. Um, how does it uh, re delaying the um, retirement age for older adults obviously, you know, could come uh, head to head to the demand for the family um, to for older uh, adult children who would like grandparents to take care of their children. This is definitely true. And so a different adjustment would need to be made. Um, the danger is that uh, some older woman would um, try to work half time and try to take care of grandparent, uh, grandchildren and uh, maybe do a lot of care, caregiving and um, their labor force participation at the same time. And that could uh, uh, negatively impact uh, their mental and physical health. That's something to pay attention to. Um, my name is Evelyn Manyara from Kenya. So I have a question in regards to gender inequality. So I've realized that uh, part I realized that part of the uh, among the challenges that are facing the elderly is um, gender inequality during retirement. And some of the policies like um, uh, that have had you uh, some of the policies that have been, given out there that I've heard you mention is women to retire at 60, then men are to, to retire at 65. That's a bit uh, discriminative according to me. So do you think there will be a time where all policies will be streamlined equally to all gender? And what are some of the solutions to ensure that? Yes, so uh, there are different arguments about uh, di different age uh, by gender of retirement. Uh, one argument could actually be saying that uh, retirement is actually a benefit to women. Uh, in the old days when life expectancies are much shorter and when women went through childbearing, uh, also some society thinks that uh, for women, uh, they should um, retire earlier. Um, another side of the argument, of course, is that you know you to take away the uh, right to participate in the labor market uh, for women if you ask them to retire earlier. Um, the trend has been uh, so um, for most countries, and I show you one of the tables uh, about retirement age. For most countries, the trend has been uh, to synchronize the age. So using the same age for both men and women. Um, uh, retirement age. Uh, but um, China today is still uh, have a five year difference for men and women. And they have been talking about re reform for a, a very long time. And you can see there are all kinds of resistance. In fact, the lower social economic group prefers to retire earlier. And the higher social economic group uh, prefer to retire later. So. It's uh, an issue that uh, it's still hotly debated, and uh, I think I believe the trend will be to uh, equalize uh, soon uh, for men and women's retirement age. Um, my name is uh, Peter Chijoke Ani from Nigeria, Africa. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful uh, presentation, and uh, I would like to know your opinion on uh, issues related to government negligence, to policies that uh, take care of the elderly, the retirement age range. For instance, in Africa, whereby uh, when uh, citizens serve the nation and at the time of retirement, the government will fail to carry out the caring plan for the elderly, for the retirement age. I would like to know your opinion on what to do to curtail these inhuman treatments on the retiring age. 
Is it the non-governmental organizations that will carry out the functions of taking care of the retiring aged citizens or the government? Because over here in Africa, they have failed to carry out their functions. They have failed to take care of the retiring aged citizens. So I would like to know your opinion in such situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I, as I was showing you earlier, um, the issue of who, whose responsibility it is to take care of um, older adults and who should be paying for uh, taking care of older adults. These are issues that has been debated and has been changing. And for most society, the responsibility has uh, for quite a long time been uh, rested in on family members. So your children, for the most part, are supposed to be uh, taking care of uh, the older adults. But with the social economic changes and with the weakening uh, family, smaller family size and so on, this responsibility has increasingly more and more been shifted to the government. You know, but uh, the government, uh, some of them, uh, many of the governments in Asia too, uh, I'm sure in Africa too, do not have the financial uh, assets, financial assets to uh, take care of the increasing uh, elderly population. So uh, increasingly they have to collaborate with the commercial uh, the, the private sectors and to uh, also collaborate with NGOs to organize all kind of caring responsibilities. Uh, so this adaptation needs to happen and uh, the government of course should take the responsibility of uh, organizing these, um, how to take care of the elderly population. Uh, but this also takes time to plan, to figure out how to finance. Uh, for the most part, before the government can, can uh, adequately uh, take care of the elderly population, most of the countries and uh, elderly populations are still relying on uh, family members, um, either siblings or spouse or uh, children to take care of them. But uh, government, of course, has a large responsibility uh, to care for older adults. Thank you.